<laughs> Hi, friends. I'm your old pal, Papa Dale. Now, I'm a retired pastor, teacher, theologian, and professor with over 50 years of service to the Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Dale Warren. Professionally, I'm known in my writing and teaching and lectures as D.A. Warren, but my friends just call me Papa Dale. So please just call me Papa Dale. You can see the details of my testimony, family life, education, and ministry experience on other videos on this playlist. But for now, let's get right into today's topic, which is, why is my beard acting like this? Oh, no, <laughs> that's not today's topic. Today's topic is the book of Nehemiah. Now, this is the JHI, the Jan Hus Institute, Bachelor of Arts in Biblical Literature, lecture number 44 on the person of, or the book of, Nehemiah. So, let's get our glasses on so we can see what we're doing. And off we go. Today, we delve into the book of Nehemiah, a profound text from the Old Testament that captures the essence of of leadership, faith, and dedication to God's mission, Nehemiah's story is one of, the, of remarkable courage and steadfastness, revealing how God uses his people to accomplish his purposes, even in the face of overwhelming adversity. Through the lens of an evangelical perspective, we'll enjoy, enjoy the biography of Nehemiah the key characteristics, dramatic events, the types of Christ presented in the text, and the implications for our Christian lives today. Nehemiah, whose name appears, whose name means Yahweh comforts, was a Jewish cupbearer to King Artaxerxes I of Persia in the 5th century BC. What's a cupbearer? His position was one of significant trust and influence, as the cupbearer was responsible for serving wine to the king and ensuring it was not poisoned. Despite his prestigious role in the Persian court, Nehemiah remained deeply committed to his Hebrew heritage and the well-being of his people. So, cupbearer is essentially a food taster, wine taster, maybe food taster too. When Nehemiah learned of the dire strait, uh, the, the dire state of Jerusalem walls and the suffering of, of his fellow Jews, he was deeply distressed. With the king's permission and support, he journeyed to Jerusalem to lead the effort to rebuild the city walls, a project that symbolized the restoration of the Jewish community and their covenant with God. What's so important about building the city walls? Well, the walls of the city didn't just symbolize, they provided the protection around the city and to the people of the city against marauding raiders and thieves who might try to enter the city surreptitiously or against a conquering army. Now, Nehemiah's leadership, marked by prayer, strategic planning, and unwavering faith, culminated in the successful reconstruction of the walls in just 52 days. Nehemiah 6, verse 15. The rebuilding of Jerusalem walls was financed by King Artaxerxes I of Persia, and Artaxerxes provided Nehemiah with letters of authorization to ensure safe passage through the regions that he would travel and to request timber from the king's forest for the construction. The king also provided resources, including materials for construction and possibly financial support, to facilitate the rebuilding effort. The financial and logistical support from King Artaxerxes was crucial for the successful completion of the project and reflects a combination of personal trust political strategy, and practical, practical considerations. And it also reflects the Spirit of God working on the heart of Artaxerxes I to move him and motivate him to do this. 
Now, the main characters in this book include Nehemiah, the main protagonist, who is a cupbearer to the Persian king who becomes governor of Jerusalem and leads the rebuilding effort. Artaxerxes I, the Persian king, who grants Nehemiah permission and support to rebuild Jerusalem walls. Sanballat, an opponent of the Jewish efforts to rebuild the walls, who seeks to thwart Nehemiah's plans. Woo! Snidely whiplash. Twist his mustache. Then we have Tobiah, another adversary of Nehemiah, who conspires with Sanballat to undermine the rebuilding. Then we have Ezra the Great, a great priest and scribe and scholar who leads the spiritual spiritual revival of the people, reading the law to the assembled Israelites. And then there is Eliashib, the high priest, who collaborates with Nehemiah in the reconstruction efforts. Then there's also Hananiah, Nehemiah's brother, who initially brings news of Jerusalem's desolation. Then there's also Geshem, an Arab, who joins Sanballat and Tobiah in opposing Nehemiah. Now, originally, I'll say, I don't know if it says it further down in the notes. I can't remember. I wrote this some time ago. But uh, I will say that in the uh, ancient Hebrew literature, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah were essentially one book, and then they were separated out, I think, at the time of the writing of the Septuagint, at the translation of the Septuagint from the Hebrew into the Greek, along with... um, Uh, Samuel Kings and the Chronicles. Uh, I chose to uh, offer them to uh, us today uh, just because I have such great respect for both Ezra and Nehemiah. And uh, it's not that I don't respect the Kings or the Chronicles, but they're more a a story, one continuous story. Uh, from First King, beginning of First Kings, all the way through uh, the end of Second Kings, and from the beginning of First Chronicles, all the way through to the end of Second Chronicles. So, I chose to keep them as one unit, as we discussed it in these lectures, but to separate out Ezra and Nehemiah. So that's just an aside. So back to the notes. Upon hearing of Jerusalem, pr- Jerusalem's plight. Nehemiah is moved to intense prayer and fasting, seeking God's guidance. His prayer, recorded in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 5 through 11, is a heartfelt plea for mercy and favor. This sets the stage for a dramatic encounter with King Artaxerxes, where Nehemiah's somber demeanor catches the king's attention. Despite the risk of offending the king, Nehemiah courageously requests permission to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the city walls. Artaxerxes, moved by the hand of God, by the Spirit of God, grants his requests and provides the necessary resources, marking a pivotal moment in Nehemiah's mission. The hand of God. There's a literary synecdoche. Uh, You want to double check all of the uh, literary forms and uh, devices that you find in uh, in these biblical lectures. Amidst constant opposition and threats from Sanballat, Tobiah, and others, Nehemiah and the Jews press on with the Reconstruction. Their perseverance and reliance on God culminate in the miraculous completion of the wall in just 52 days. This achievement not only secures Jerusalem, but demonstrates God's favor and power to their enemies, who are disheartened by the Jews' success. This event underscores the themes of divine assistance and the triumph of faith-driven action. Now, Nehemiah's role was multifaceted, but he is most accurately described as what we'd think of today as a contractor in the context of his primary primary responsibilities. Here's a description of his roles. Nehemiah's primary role could be described as a 
contractor. Nehemiah's most noticeable accomplishment was overseeing the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls. He organized the people, managed the construction process, and addressed logistical challenges, much like a contractor, a general contractor, managing a large construction project. His secondary role has some elements that could be described as a warrior. Nehemiah faced opposition from threats of violence. Remember, remember Sanballat and, and Tobiah? And there was one other guy in there too. And Nehemiah had to be vigilant and strategic. These guys were, you know, during the day, the workers for Nehemiah would build up the wall. And during the night, I can only imagine these guys would go out and tear it down. However, Nehemiah's role was not that typically of a warrior in a traditional sense. His primary focus was on rebuilding and administrative reforms rather than engaging in military combat. Although I can imagine that he was also a fighter. He would find the work of his builders torn down. I imagine he was pretty irritated by that. So he was like a tough no nonsense, let's get the job done, sort of man. And man, if you are in opposition to that, you are in deep trouble with me. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be in deep trouble with Nehemiah. A few types of Christ appear in Nehemiah. Nehemiah himself can be seen as a type of Christ in several ways. The book does not explicitly present Christ in a direct manner, as it is part of the Old Testament. However, several types and foreshadows of Christ can be observed through the characters and events in Nehemiah. Nehemiah himself is a type of Christ. He's an intercessor. Nehemiah prays for his people, similar to how Christ intercedes for believers. See Nehemiah 1, verses 4 through 11. He's a rebuilder. Nehemiah, re Nehemiah rebuilds the walls of Jerusalem, symbolizing Christ's work of rebuilding and restoring lives. And Nehemiah was a leader and shepherd. Nehemiah leads and cares for the people of Jerusalem, much like Christ leads his followers as a shepherd. And the number two type of Christ, the wall and gates, protection and security. The walls represent protection and security, akin to Christ being the protector of believers. The gates themselves could also be a type of Christ. Each gate could symbolize different aspects of salvation in the life of Christ. And then there is point number three under the uh, subhead of types of Christ, Ezra's role and how it impacts the law and the word. Ezra reads the law to the people, reflecting Christ as the word of God and the fulfillment of the law. What did Jesus do right after his baptism? He went to the temple and he took up the scroll of Isaiah and he read the word of God publicly and aloud to the people. From an evangelical perspective, the book of Nehemiah is traditionally attributed to, ta-da, Nehemiah himself, the central figure of the narrative. Evangelicals believe that Nehemiah, a Jewish cupbearer to the Persian king Artaxerxes, authored the book to document his efforts to rebuild Jerusalem walls and reform the community. Nehemiah's detailed first-person account including his prayers, personal experiences, and administrative reforms, suggests he was closely involved in the events described. The book's focus on leadership, prayer, and the covenant renewal reinforces its historical authenticity and theological significance. Evangelicals view Nehemiah's authorship as integral to understanding the book's message of divine guidance and resilience in the face of adversity, highlighting the importance of faithfulness and obedience to God's commands amidst the challenges of restoration and reform. 
Nehemiah's memoirs are evident in the first-person narrative found throughout much of the text. For example, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1, and chapter 7, verse 5. This autobiographical style lends authenticity and a personal touch to the accounts. Uh, A touch so personal it would be hard to imagine someone else other than Nehemiah writing this account. Now, Ezra's contribution, Ezra the Great, his contribution is apparent in the sections that overlap with the book of Ezra, particularly the lists and genealogies, which suggest a shared source or collaboration between the two men. Do you think they knew each other? I think they knew each other. They're both warriors for Yahweh. They're fighting to get the project done that Yahweh wants done. The combined efforts of Nehemiah and Ezra reflect a unified purpose in documenting the physical and spiritual restoration of Jerusalem and its people. Well, archaeology plays a significant role in understanding the historical context of the book of Nehemiah, and here are a few ways that it contributes. Archaeology, the historical context. Archaeological findings help corroborate the historical events described in Nehemiah, such as the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls. Excavations of ancient Jerusalem reveal the layout and construction techniques that align with Nehemiah's account. Point number two, the topographical evidence. Discoveries of ancient city walls and gates correspond to the descriptions in Nehemiah. For instance, excavations have identified the remains of walls that match the locations and dimensions described in the text. And here is a third way that archaeological discoveries uh, support the uh, narrative of Nehemiah. And that is, number three, the cultural insights. Artifacts, such as inscriptions and documents, provide insights into the administrative and social aspects of the Persian period. And the Persian period frames the context of Nehemiah's governorship. And fourthly, the religious practices. Archaeological evidence of religious practices and artifacts from the period supports the account of Nehemiah's efforts to reform Jewish worship and practices. Overall, archaeology helps to confirm the historical and cultural setting of Nehemiah providing a richer understanding of the narrative and its authenticity. Pardon me. Now, the book of Nehemiah offers several profound lessons for Christians today. One, lesson number one, prayerful dependence on God. Nehemiah's consistent turn to prayer in times of need and thanksgiving. Nehemiah 1, verses 4 through 11 Chapter 2, verse 4, chapter 4, verse 9, chapter 6, verse 9. These exemplify a life rooted in dependence on God. As believers, we are reminded to seek God's guidance and strength in all of our endeavors. Lesson number two, be courageous, courageous leadership. Nehemiah's boldness in approaching King Artaxerxes and leading the rebuilding efforts amidst opposition. See Nehemiah 2, verses 1 through 9, and 4, verses 1 through 23. And this challenges us to step out in faith and lead courageously in our own contexts, trusting God's provision and protection. Pardon me. And so, now we have profound lesson number three, and that has to do with community and cooperation. The reconstruction of Jerusalem's walls require the collective effort of the entire community. See Nehemiah chapter 3, verses 1 through 32. This reflects the importance of unity and cooperation within the body of Christ. 
working together to fulfill God's purposes. And what are we on? This is Profound Lessons for Today. (laughs) I'm old. I forget things. Profound Lessons for Today. Point number four, perseverance amidst opposition. Nehemiah's perseverance despite the relentless opposition. Nehemiah 4, 1 through 23 and 6, 1 through 14 encourages us to remain steadfast in our faith and mission, knowing that God is with us and we will and will see us through the challenges. And the profound lesson number five. Five. Sorry. Profound lesson number five has to do with spiritual renewal. The spiritual revival led by Ezra with the public reading of the law and the people's renewed commitment to God. See Nehemiah 8 verses 1 through 12. And the highlights were the necessity of returning to God's worship and renewing our commitment to live according to his purpose and precepts. And so spiritual renewal is important for you and for me. So, in conclusion, Book of Nehemiah is a rich tapestry of history, leadership, and faith. Nehemiah's life and actions provide us, you and me, with a model of godly leadership demonstrating the power of prayer, the importance of community, and the necessity of perseverance. This story interwoven with the efforts of Ezra and the people of Jerusalem reflects a collective commitment to God's mission, underscoring the transformative impact of faith-driven action and the faith-driven life. As we reflect on Nehemiah's legacy, may we be inspired to lead lives marked by prayer, courage, cooperation, and unwavering faith in God's promises. Just as Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, we too are called to be builders in God's kingdom, restoring and renewing our communities through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us go forth with the same zeal and dedication, confident that God, who began a good work in us, will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. See Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Amen. And so this has been your old pal, Papa Dale. I've been your host for this Bible study on the book of this lecture for the uh, Jan Hus Institute uh, for the Bachelor of Arts degree in Biblical Literature. Um, Papa Dale here, and this is in the year 2024 that this is being recorded. So I will remind you that if you are pursuing the Bachelor of Arts degree, you need to read, it's part of the requirements now, You need to read the words of the lecture. Now, why is that? Sometimes the heart will say, well, gosh, you're making me watch the lecture twice. You're making me read the lecture notes once. You're making me read uh, the book of Nehemiah twice in two different versions. What's up with that? It's all about spaced repetition, which is the main way of educating someone. Another main way is dramatic impact, but I can't reach through your uh, video, through the video, and slap you alongside the head, say, pay attention, so I have to get you to repeat things over and over again. So, read the lecture notes, you're going to find them down below and or in the comments section, and probably the best way, actually, to read through the notes is by the video transcript, because I embellish a lot. And all of my embellishments are not in the uh, lecture notes, which is why they're called embellishments. So anyway, (laughs) until the next time you see this old smiling face of Papa Deo, uh, I will tell you that uh, I'm going to be praying for you, that you will be well, and that you will be blessed.